Good day. Well, the House of Commons is shut down today. We have uh, another little thing, but we're going to check out the China report. So there's uh, this committee on China-Canada relations, and this time we have an excellent speaker. He knows his stuff. McKinsey, they've been in uh, China for decades. They were the, the beginning of it, and they're an outstanding. They know their stuff. Check this out. Your mic should be on mute. I'd now like to welcome His Excellency Dominic Barton, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Canada to the People's Republic of China, as well as Ms. Joya Donnelly, Councillor Political Affairs, and Mr. Sean Steele, Style, I believe. Style? Yes. Um, Executive Director, Greater China Policy and Coordination. Thank you for being here. Ambassador Barton, please proceed with your opening remarks. Bonsoir, Mr. Chair, honorable members, thank you for the invitation to appear before you tonight. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss my Tibet trip. I know that it's an area of great interest for Canadians and is at the forefront in our efforts to promote rights and freedoms in China. I also welcome the invitation from the committee to provide an update on a few developments since my last appearance in February. As Minister Champagne highlighted during his testimony to the committee last month, we need to be smart and coordinated when it comes to our relationship with China, and we need to work with others. Countries all around the world are evolving their approach to China and all recognize the complexity of the relationship. I think Canadians understand that there are times when we need to challenge China. We need to work with partners to hold them to account. At the same time, there are times when we need to cooperate economically and as we face global issues such as climate change. I'm tremendously proud of the work our embassy staff do every day to navigate this complex relationship. Our government has clearly laid out my top priority, and that's the safety and security of Canadians, leading with the release of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, as well as clemency for Robert Schellenberg. Equally, the promotion and protection of human rights is an integral part of our work. We continue to raise both the arbitrary detention of Canadians and human rights issues with the Chinese government in public, in private, and in collaboration with like-minded countries. Our mission network in China has a host of programs that seek to empower progressive voices and shine a light on existing difficulties. Uh, just for example, in the last month, we've hosted a two-day event on women empowerment to mark 25 years since the Beijing World Conference on Women. We've also engaged with children of migrant workers and with family members of human rights defenders. We are concerned by the decline in civil and political rights in China. We, along with the international community, have raised our deep concerns publicly, and Canada has taken concrete measures following the imposition of the national security legislation in Hong Kong. We remain deeply concerned by the troubling reports of human rights violations in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And the government has repeatedly raised our concerns, including most recently at the UN, alongside 38 other countries. We remain concerned by the continuous restrictions on the freedoms of Tibetans. And this brings me to the focus of this presentation, which is my visit to Tibet. I visited the Tibet Autonomous Region uh, with nine other diplomats at the invitation of the People's Republic of China. In recent years, as you know, access to Tibet has become increasingly challenging, including for foreign government officials. Despite repeated requests, this was the first time a Canadian diplomat has visited Tibet since 2015. My visit was from October 26th to 30th, and we visited the Tibetan capital of Lhasa, as well as the Shannon Prefecture. I see the invitation in itself coming after five years of consistent requests from our part as positive. We were pleased that the government of China extended this invitation, but I was also very aware that our visit would be controlled and focused on what they wanted us to see. The decision to participate was not taken lightly, and before doing so, I spoke with the representatives of the Tibetan community in Canada, with Canadian academics who specialize in Tibetan studies, and with experts around the world who work on human rights issues to seek their views. All agreed that it was important for me to participate given that so few have had access to the Tibet Autonomous Region in recent years. We should also remember that few Tibetans have had the opportunity to connect with foreigners. I felt that it was important for Tibetans to see that outsiders still show up and care deeply about their situation. 
for them to see that Canada cares. For these reasons, and as part of a broader engagement on Tibetan issues, I decided to go. We had a very packed program over three days. Uh, most activities would fit under the themes of economic development, environmental protection, education, culture, and religion. What I saw was not the entire picture on any issue, but I, was none, I nonetheless want to share with the committee what I was able to observe. On the economic development front, I visited an industrial park with close to 140 greenhouses growing cash crop. I saw busy stores and markets selling Tibetan goods. I met a Tibetan businesswoman who ran a hotel with Tibetans in management at the working level. Uh, she told me numerous times uh, that the hotel chain being Tibetan owned needed more foreign tourists uh, to come. I visited a village where people had been resettled as part of a poverty alleviation program. There, I met a man and his family who were nomads, and he now works in the construction trade. I was also able to see the beautiful Tibetan Buddhist shrine he had meticulously built on the second floor of his house. Chinese officials uh, often talk to you in numbers and statistics. They point to government statistics such as absolute poverty having been completely alleviated in the Tibetan Autonomous Region as of 2019, or the fact that they have close to 100% broadband coverage across the region. Uh, our own assessment is that inequality remains a critical issue. Resettlement and displacement of Tibetans are also a stark reminder that freedom of choice and the ability to live out one's cultural or other values are equally a measure of well being or prosperity, as is material wealth. Our group made other visits to places including the Lalu wetlands, known as the lungs of Lhasa, and saw a conservation area teeming with wildlife. We visited the Lhasa Experimental Primary School, where I saw mostly Tibetan and some Han students being taught primarily in Mandarin, with some teaching in Tibetan, for example, classes in calligraphy, chess, and opera. This school was impressive, but I recognize that most schools in Tibet are probably not of that caliber. It would be important to see schools in the rural areas uh, where more than 70% of the people live. I also visited the University of Tibetan Medicine and the Academy of Tonka Paintings. We visited cultural and religious sites including the Patala Palace and Norbalinka. Both were profoundly moving. A reminder of the incredible religious and human accomplishments of the Tibetan people and of the importance of ensuring their rights. At the Samya Monastery, we saw young monks studying. Uh, the visit was led by monks and we were able to speak with some of them. During my entire visit, top of mind were Canada's concerns about the human rights situation affecting Tibetans, including restrictions on freedom of expression, of movement and of religion or belief, and the protection of linguistic and cultural rights. I was able to raise these issues during official meetings and in side conversations with officials in Tibet. I also raised specific cases of concern with Chinese authorities while there. I sought out opportunities to speak with local Tibetans. Those whom I met expressed great pride in their culture, and it was evident that the Tibetan language and cultural preservation remain very important to them. In speaking with officials, I advocated for unhindered future access to Tibet for UN agencies, academics, researchers, and journalists, as well as return visits by other Canadian representatives. While my visit to Tibet was very short, I hope it opens doors to more contact with Tibetans inside China and demonstrates that Canada is still very much engaged in the promotion of their rights and freedoms. Though my appearance today is to be largely about my visit to Tibet, as I understand it, I want to further address the cases of Mr. Kolberg and Mr. Spaver, something that I know is very important to members of this committee and all Canadians. As I said earlier, this is my top priority. This week, December 10, will mark the second anniversary of their arbitrary arrest and detention. We continue to call on China to immediately release both men. In October, after a hiatus of many months and much effort by the embassy and the minister, we secured on-site virtual consular access to Mr. Kolberg and Mr. Spaver. I've since met with them, both of them, on two occasions to confirm their health and well-being. The resilience and strength they have shown has been an inspiration to me, as I know it has been to many Canadians. In closing, this committee plays a vital role to understand the difficult and complex nature 
of Canada's relationship with China. It also plays a crucial role in the national conversation we are having about Canada's evolving approach to China. The Canadian Parliament, the Canadian government, and the Canadian people have a lot at stake in getting this approach right. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. We'll go to the first round of questions uh, to Mr. Jenis for six minutes. Mr. Jenis. Mr. Jenis, I don't hear you. Hello, how's that? That's better, thank you. Okay, Tashi Delek, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, the majority of my questions in this round will focus on Tibet, uh, but I do want to first uh, start with a follow-up from your last appearance. Uh, Mr. Barton, at the, at the last uh, time you appeared before this committee, you made a controversial statement about Mr. Hussein Chalil's citizenship status. Could you please confirm, confirm today that you do recognize that Mr. Chalil is a Canadian citizen? And could you please update this committee on all of the efforts you have made with respect to his case? Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, I want to reassert that uh, Mr. Hussein John Jalil is a Canadian citizen. Um, after the uh, last testimony, I spoke with his wife uh, just to reinforce to her and the family uh, the importance of his case. And then we raised his case with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to say that we want access to him. We want to understand how he is doing. We have subsequently followed up because, as I've mentioned, the Chinese only recognize his, his Chinese citizenship, not his Canadian citizenship, and he is Canadian. And as we said, we need to make sure that his family has access and is able to understand how what his well-being is. Th thank you for that response. Is securing the release of Mr. Chalil as important to you as securing the release of the two Michaels? Yes, it is. I think we have, as you know, over 120 consular cases where people are in detention. And while the, the sort of the public focus is on obviously Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, and that's where we spend a lot of time, uh, there is a, a very large consular team here where we look after everyone and make sure that we get access and, and drive it uh, drive it through. So there's a you know the, there's thank, thank, a lot thank of you. effort. Yeah. Thank you for that response, and and I think uh, you know that we're going to continue to follow up on that case. Uh, Reuters reported earlier this year uh, that China is pushing growing numbers of Tibetan rural laborers off the land into recently built military style training centers where they are turned into factory workers, mirroring a program in Western Xinjiang region that rights groups have branded coercive labor. Uh, end of quote. I know uh, you've been to Xinjiang before. I wonder uh, if you think similar tactics are being used in Tibet as we know are being used in Xinjiang. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Yes, also, uh, Adrian Sense has written a, a very good report, I believe it was in September that we read before we went there, saying that uh, roughly you know, 500,000 people have been put into those facilities. We, we were not able to see that because of where we were in Lhasa and, and, uh, and Shannon Prefecture, so we were not able to, uh, to see that. Clearly, there is an effort going on to take people from, you know, the, the land, if you will, on, you know, with the view of trying to reduce income uh, or, or improve the, the um, poverty alleviation situation, and they're being moved into industrial jobs. But we, we weren't able to get any sense of, uh, of that or what that looked like, but we were very much aware of that. Okay. Uh, the Chinese government asserts that all of these relocation operations are voluntary. Uh, Human Rights Watch has conducted interviews uh, finding finding the opposite essentially so uh you know i and I, I i would maybe disagree with your characterization of the intentions behind these policies as being based in economic development i see that as the as the veneer uh but but not not the reality and and not the intention uh are we seeing birth suppression in tibet similar to what we're seeing in xinjiang uh, uh forced abortion forced insertion of iud's uh forced sterilization thanks for the question um we we spoke to the people that were, we were able to visit. I mentioned uh, we saw two families. We broke the group up into two parts. Um, and that question was actually asked. Now, again, we had uh, party officials surrounding us. So, I, you know, you, I'm just telling you what we heard. And, and we asked that question about, are there any 
limits on the number of children you can have or your grandchildren can have and so forth. And they said no. But I but I think that's a you know, we have to look at the statistics to see actually what's happening to the birth rate. And that's why I think we have to get more access. I think that's the critical factor here. From were, were you, th thank you, were you ever able to, uh, to interact with Tibetans without uh, Chinese government monitoring? Uh, yes, I was. I was actually quite surprised uh, at that um, on a number of occasions. One was uh, early in the morning, uh, mainly because I couldn't sleep, to be honest. I had a difficulty adjusting to the altitude. Um, I was up at five in the morning and wandered the, the streets. There was no one behind me. There weren't a lot of people on the street, but I saw people. Um, and then when we were during the lunch periods, um, we were allowed to move around. So I tried to go into as many bookstores as I could. Um, and I was there uh, basically, you know, I, by myself. I was a bit surprised. Maybe I'm sure okay. there are cameras looking at they, me, but. They yeah, thank you. I just want to get one more question before my time is up. Uh, did you raise or discuss the whereabouts of the Panchen Lama or the government of China's efforts to control the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama? Yes, I did raise uh, the, the question about the, the Panchen Lama that the Dalai Lama had selected. Um, and we raised that and said, where, where is he? How is he doing? How do we get to see him? Their response is there's one Panchen Lama, and that's not the person. And uh, he's fine. And he doesn't want to speak to people. But we raised that and it wasn't just raised by me it was raised by other members in the in the group and the reincarnation question yeah the reincarnation question there was a discussion uh, or assertions by that where the uh, government officials talked about the golden urn process um, and how that you know historically has been used so thank you thank you sorry but we have to interrupt because mr Genesis' time is up and now we'll go to uh, mr prejuscatus for six minutes please Ambassador, thank you for being here and for the work that you are doing. I do uh, want to focus on Tibet here, but I would be remiss if I, on behalf of my constituents, many of whom who have contacted me over the past couple of years now about uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. Um, I know you're limited to about what you can say because of privacy law, but can you comment at all to this, uh, this committee and to Canadians about their general health and well-being? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you said outright, I, I'm limited by the Privacy Act in terms of what I can discuss in any detail. What, what I would say is that uh, they are both very healthy physically and mentally. Um, I have to tell you, I'm deeply inspired by their resilience and their uh, mindset. Um, it's, it's incredible uh, given uh, what, what they're going through. So I would just say there, and the other thing, just what I was realized too in talking with the families, these are, you know, they're Canadians who have families that are worried about them, haven't seen them, uh, are worried about their health, their mental health, uh, but they're very, very strong. And uh, it's, it's remarkable. Extraordinary individuals both, and, and thank you for, for that ambassador. Uh, I wanted to ask now about Tibet. Uh, what would you say to those who are of the view that Canada can uh, can only do so much? It can exert itself only so much on such issues because it is a middle power and our, our reach is limited. While well-intentioned, uh, our reach will always be limited. There is that view in foreign po policy circles and other circles. What would your response to that be? My, uh, Mr. Chair, my, my response would be is, you know, while, while we're a middle power, we're an, we're an important and influential power. And I think particularly because of our views of, of, on human rights, our multiculturalism, and, and also I think our own experience. You know, we have not done such a great job ourselves with the Indigenous people who are here. We speak from some experience of, of maybe how can we do things uh, differently. I think we, it's important to have some humility in that, but I think garners respect that we actually know what we're we're talking about. We're a country that is able to have, you know, a very vibrant, important French community uh, that that can can have to have votes about whether they want to separate or not. And I think we represent a lot of of very very good things. And so I think it's important we're there. Yes, we can't force people to do things, but by asking questions, by uh, showing up by working with other countries, 
by continuing to keep this on the table, by working with the the Tibetan, the, the, what I've learned, because I'm not a Tibetan expert, but just the uh, the the community that we have in in Canada, which is very vibrant, um, very thoughtful. You know, there's there actually is a lot we 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 can do. Um, so I I think that's what, particularly in these times of change, it's important we do stand up for that for that, and there is there there is a lot we can do. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I'm inclined to very much agree with you, but I want to ask because you, you raised some really interesting points there. Uh, did you uh, did you put that forward, that perspective forward? And if so, uh, who did you raise such points with and how did you do it? What means did you uh, sort of uh, decide to, to uh, put that message uh, to the, uh, whether it was to Chinese authorities or to, to others? Well, during the trip, again, there were uh, probably as many uh, Chinese and Tibetan uh, Chinese officials in with us on the trip. And so th and there were a lot of bus rides that we had. So there were a lot of uh, informal conversations about that. And then actually, when we had the meeting with the deputy party secretary, uh, we, you know, I raised the, the, that issue with the deputy party secretary that we, you know, we have some experience we have some views of how i think we can help so it was i think it was seen i think the fact that canada was asked to come to this there's a lot of countries that want to do it I, there must be i honestly don't know why they asked us there's a lot of other countries that would like to go i i've got to believe that there's some sense that um we we want to try and help play play some role so it was informally uh you know Formally with the deputy party secretary, um, but that there was lots of that sort of discussion. Understood, Ambassador. I have one minute left with my last question. I wanted to ask you: uh, To what extent have you been engaged with ambassadors from other countries, other like-minded liberal democracies, on this very question, on the question of Tibet? Actually, quite extensively, Mr. Chair. Uh, before the trip, I met with the group that went ahead of time, which included the, the Swiss and the Norwegian ambassador, just to get a sense of what they were able to look at, what would they do differently, and so forth. And then I hosted a couple of sessions with ambassadors who weren't able to go, just to share what we learned and what they may want to ask for in the trip that hopefully they get to go on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jenis. And now, maintenant, on va procéder. And now, we will move along with Mr. Bergeron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Your Excellency, for being with us once again. Thank you for the work you are doing for Canada and the People's Republic of China. There's one part of your presentation that really drew my attention, and that was uh, the visit to the hotel. I was very surprised to discover that there was a hotel. Given the restrictions imposed on foreign travelers, I imagine that this hotel is essentially reserved to domestic travelers from the People's Republic of China, particularly Han Chinese who would travel to Tibet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, for that uh, that observation. I also was surprised uh, by that too, and it wasn't choreographed, if you will. I just uh, discovered it. That, you know, she was helping when we were having dinner. It was actually before a performance that we were going to see called Princess Wen Chung. Um, and so, uh, yeah, she. I was very surprised uh, by that. Uh, they actually do have a lot of Chinese Han tourists, as you mentioned. Uh, they, last year, they said there were 40 million uh, Han Chinese tourists. What I found interesting, and it's something to someone else to do deeper work on, there are a lot of, of Chinese Buddhists. That one number I heard, and, and I please check with experts, not, not what I'm saying, but just the number I heard was there could be 300 million. And so people are coming, I think, not just for the tourism, if you will, but because, because the, these uh, sites are actually quite important to them. So a lot of uh, they were Han tourists, and what what she was asking for is it would be great to have more foreign tourists uh, be able to uh, come to the session. She it was a bit of an oddity to see 
you know, someone like myself or, or, or others uh, there and saying like, you know, you, you, more people should visit from Canada. And I said that, no kidding, we would like to, you know, if we could get access, uh, that would be great. You might want to raise that, but, but um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Oui, oui, très bien, merci. Yeah, yes, thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. I'd like to uh, discuss the language issue and cultural issue. According to certain international reports, there have been considerable efforts made by Chinese authorities to limit, if not to um, have the cultural Tibetan aspects uh, disappear completely. So did you, during your visit, have any opportunity to discuss with Tibetans in Tibetan? Did the Chinese authorities provide interpreters who spoke Tibetan, or did the, were the discussions expected to all occur in Mandarin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that the whole area of, of language is a very important focus uh, on the trip. And what we did was we, we did ask, but again, recognizing when you ask those sort of questions. Channel report.